Thank you. I'm glad you're all sitting down. I'm going to show you something astonishing. That is a UFO. <laughs> I photographed it myself. I was working diligently at the office one day. I saw a flash of light. I managed to get my camera out. And I think I saw a little gray hand wave at me. <laughs> By your laughter, I see that you're skeptical. And that's what I'm going to talk about today. That skepticism might be a very good thing. In fact, that skepticism might make you more empathetic. It might make you a better listener. It's going to reduce how angry you feel when somebody disagrees with you. And it's even going to make your workday better. So let me explain. First, we need to define what we mean by skepticism. I like Carl Sagan's approach. We approach claims with an open mind, but only accept those that have undergone rigorous scientific tests. It doesn't mean we're cynical. It means we approach claims and ask for evidence. And I think we can go a step farther. I think we need to understand the biases that lead us to make mistakes. The mind is an amazing thing. We take in a lot of information. We process it quickly and, for the most part, accurately. To do that, though, we need to take some shortcuts now and then. As an example, when you walked in this theater today, it might have been the first time you were here. But you basically knew what to do, right? If you think about it, there was all sorts of shapes and colors and things you've never seen before. But your brain quite quickly went, yeah, this, this is similar to that other thing. Quick shortcut, you knew what to do. Now imagine we couldn't do that. You would walk in here and go, uh-oh. <laughs> There's going to be a speaker somewhere. Where will they be? <laughs> I'm going to need to sit. Is there a vessel for such a thing? <laughs> We'd shut down. So while these shortcuts are efficient, they can occasionally lead us astray. And those are some of the biases that it's important for skeptics to understand. I think one of the most powerful biases we have is the confirmation bias. So it's our tendency to seek out information that supports our belief and to dismiss or deny evidence that goes against our beliefs. We all do this. It's even associated with a dopamine release. That's a neurotransmitter that fires when we are experiencing a reward. It feels good when people support our beliefs. Most of our friends are similar to us. Why? It's nice when you have people agree with you. Most of our romantic relationships are with people who are generally similar to us. We like that. So this confirmation bias can be quite powerful. Let me give you an example. I was talking to a friend, and they said they were dreading work. The reason why is that it was a full moon. They thought work was going to be terrible. Now, it's a commonly held belief that full moons can supposedly cause all sorts of negative behaviors. But I said to them, good news. Turns out, that's not true. There's no evidence that a full moon impacts behavior. Researchers have looked at this. Crime rates don't change. Behavior doesn't change. I guarantee you, the full moon will not make your day worse. And then I explained it in the context of confirmation bias. And I said, what's happening is that when you are expecting there to be a bad day when it's a full moon, you recognize all the things that are bad that day and say, aha, I knew it. It was because of the full moon. And they said, thank you, that's really interesting. And as an educator, I felt pretty good about myself for 15 minutes. 15 minutes pass, and the same person says, well, time to go to work. I'm going to leave early because it's a full moon, and you know what traffic's like on a full moon. <laughs> so disappointing, but on the other hand, a pretty good example of confirmation bias. Something else is going on there, too, in this example. That person was experiencing dissonance. Now, you might be familiar with cognitive dissonance. If we hold simultaneously, simultaneous beliefs that are contradictory, or a behavior in a belief that's contradictory, it leads to dissonance. It's basically psychological stress, and we don't like it. We try very hard to alleviate that stress. As an example, if you smoke, which is a behavior, and you believe smoking kills you, which is a cognition, that will lead to dissonance. You'll feel bad. So be motivated to get rid of that feeling. There's basically three ways to do it. First thing you can do is to stop smoking. Behavior is gone. Dissonance is reduced. If you smoke, 
you know that's hard. Another thing you could do is add a new cognition. And this is what smokers tend to do. They'll say something like this. I smoke. I know smoking's bad, but I had a great uncle. They lived to be 105. They smoked a pack a day. I'll be fine. Now, that'll reduce dissonance. It'll kill you, but it will reduce dissonance. The other thing we can do, we could change a cognition. You could say, I've heard smoking kills you. I don't believe it. With dissonance, it doesn't matter if you're right or wrong. It just matters if you believe it. That's what reduces dissonance. And again, that would be a bad choice. And the example I used with the full moon, let's say somebody recognizes it's a full moon, they go to work, they have a bad day, and go, ha, it's a full moon. It happens to them several times. And somebody comes along and says, not true. What you experienced is wrong. Well, that should arouse some dissonance. So what you could do is just say, I don't believe that person. And that's exactly what happened in this case. These things happen automatically. They happen to all of us. It's amazing that we don't always know exactly why we do what we do. Let's look at the power of expectation. There's a study done looking at wine tasting. People are brought into the lab. Half were told the wine they're about to taste was from a bottle that is $90. The other half were told it was from a bottle that is $10. Everyone, of course, got the same wine. The wine was identical. They were then asked to rate it. And, perhaps not surprisingly, people with the $90 bottle of wine said that it was more complex, more robust. It was a better wine. But here's what's really cool. This was done using a functional MRI. And it, there's actually difference in brain activity. When people were told that bottle of wine was $90, their medial orbitofrontal cortex lit up. That's the part of the brain that responds to pleasurable experiences. When they were told it was $10, it didn't light up. It's the same wine. <laughs> it's identical. So it's important to understand that our expectations not only change our behavior, they physiologically change what's going on in our brains. Let me give you a couple more biases. We tend to be unrealistically optimistic. So there's a survey of one million high school students. They were asked, how do you score on the dimension of your ability to get along with others? 100% said they're above average. Everybody. Now, not everyone can be above average, right? Because there's an average. In fact, 60% thought they were in the top 10%, and nearly a quarter of them said they were in the top 1%. This ties into another bias. There's something called the bias blind spot. What researchers have found is that when we learn about biases like this, we say, oh yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I know people that do that. <laughs> but we don't recognize that we all do it. And it doesn't feel like we do because our thinking is automatic and we feel like we're in control and we don't recognize that these things happen. As an example, I just told you about the study with a million high school students. So they were asked, are you above average in your ability to get along with others? So let me pose this question to you. Are you above average in your ability to get along with others? Yes. <laughs> we all are. And we'll say things like, well, I know what you're saying, but really, I, I am quite good with people. <laughs> We're all saying that <laughs> right now, myself included. So I said that being skeptical can make us more empathetic, can make us better listeners. How? Think about the last time you had a contentious argument. So something along the lines of what you're not supposed to speak about at the dinner table, um, sex, politics, religion, any of those things. What probably happened is that you started to kind of get your back up and you started to think of counter arguments. You weren't really listening to what the other person was saying. You're waiting for your chance to speak and your chance to attack. The only thing you're really listening for is holes in their argument. What researchers have found is, for the most part, in these arguments, what happens is that people believe stronger in their initial viewpoint after the argument. Because they spend that time thinking about how they are going to defend their position, rather than listening. On top of that, the arguments usually kind of end like this. People like each other less. 
So they believe stronger in the thing they initially started arguing about, and they don't care much for the person they were arguing with. Now, let's say we think like skeptics in this position. We recognize our biases. We recognize the biases of others. And two things are going to happen. The first thing is that you're going to start asking some questions. You're going to try to understand where the other person is coming from. You're going to recognize that you have a confirmation bias as well. You know you're looking for information that supports what you believe. But you're going to push that aside. You might learn that you're not entirely correct, which is good. At the very least, you're going to learn a new perspective. The second thing that will happen, the tone of the conversation changes completely. If you start asking questions and you're genuinely interested in why they think what they think, you'll just feel the air and the tension lower. And then you can talk. That's the goal. You might not change the person's mind, but at least you won't leave the conversation hating each other. So this is a good start. I said as well that being a good skeptic can make the workday better. If you expect a meeting to be terrible, it will be. <laughs> Every time. Why? It's the confirmation bias. You're expecting something to be bad. What do you look for? The things that are bad. And then remember them and confirm, aha, <laughs> I knew it. So what do we do? Well, some research shows that even mood can be a driver on this. If we're in a bad mood, we're looking for things that will confirm that bad mood. I'm not saying we need to force ourselves into good moods all the time. Being in a bad mood is human. That's going to happen. But what we can do is say, OK, I'm in a bad mood. I know I am. <laughs> I have to go to this meeting. I'm going to look for four good things. Just force yourself to focus on the positive. A couple things will happen again you are going to have a better meeting, and you're probably going to have a better or more accurate representation of what actually happened. It's not colored by mood or colored by expectation. It's hard to do. We really have to force ourselves, but the research shows it works. So to sum up, being skeptical makes us more pleasant to be around, makes our workday better. Not only that, we become better consumers of information. So when we hear extraordinary claims, such as UFOs, we should always seek out alternative explanations. We should always ask for more evidence. It could be that a UFO flew by the university and that someone was lucky enough to get a photo. Or it could be that one day a professor was bored in his office and taped a nickel to his window and took a photo of it. <laughs> we will never know the answer, but I leave you with this. Stay skeptical. Thank you. <laughs>